I, I laugh because Judy, after a few weeks, she said, oh, have you met Chris Hemsworth yet? And I said, yeah, yeah, I met him, met him a few days ago. And she said, oh, how was it? I said, fuck him. And she's laughing. She said, what do you mean, <laughs> fuck him? I said, fuck him. I said, he's six foot four. You know, he's built like a brick shit house. you know, and he's right. got this deep voice. I said, he's even got perfect skin. And she laughed. She said, oh, you yeah. even notice he had perfect skin. I said, who needs all of that? You know, I said, fuck him. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. I'm Keith Vitale, and welcome to Psychic Podcast. In this episode, I'm so excited to have back on as my guest today for part two interview, my very good friend, Richard Norton. Um, let me tell you a little bit about him before I bring him on. He, of course, he's a world-renowned martial artist. He's an actor. He's a stuntman. He's also I, I, he's a fight choreographer and sometimes even a second unit director. Uh, you've been in over a hundred movies and TV shows to your credit and you bodyguard to some of the most famous personalities and celebrities on this planet. So you say hi to my good friend, Richard. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for having me on again. We'll, we'll have another fun session. I'm sure we were laughing with your, your producer there. That's about how I love talking with old friends like you, cause we're both like big kids, you know, we just get so excited. <laughs> We start reliving some old old moments, and I hope I hope the audience understand that we're giggling away like like kids and everything. But I hope they enjoy it just as much as we do. Wonderful. I well, again, I want to apologize because the first episode, uh, even though it was out all over social platforms, it was for me personally. I wanted just to reconnect with you and share stories. And my God, did I have a great time! And it, it, it didn't even care. It just I just enjoyed myself so much. And I loved hearing the stories about you working with, of course, Chuck Norris and an Octagon and then working with Samuel Hung and uh, Jackie Chan and Yong Bao. And oh, my gosh, it was such a treat. But why, I want to start this podcast for the fans, because I know so many people are going to be so interested in what you're doing now and some of the very popular TV shows and, of course, movies you've worked on. And again, I am a martial artist, but I'm a movie fan first. I love, well, maybe not first, but I love movies and TV shows. And one of my favorite shows of all time, all time, is Spartacus. And so when you were on Spartacus, I had no advance notice. No one did. And all of a sudden, there was millions of martial artists that are so proud of everything that you've accomplished. And there you are. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about your experiences working on that. But let me just say this first, and then I'm going to let you talk. I grew up in Italy for four years. My dad was in the service, and we're Italian, so my dad would take me to the Colosseum and play in the Colosseum. Now, I don't know if that had any influence or impact on my life, me becoming a fighter later on, but it probably did. But if you said, what show, if you could pick any show in a wish list, what show would you like to be a member of or a cast member? It would have been Spartacus. Now, I would have to gain some weight and gain some muscle and look like you. So it could have never happened. But you were there. What was it like? Did you have to get trained for your sword fighting? Did you did you have input in your choreography? Just go through that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, no, there was there was a – I had worked with this Rick Jacobson who I had worked on a, on a movie with. That's kind of how I ended up being on Spartacus. He remembered working with me. I guess they contacted me, asked me if I was interested in doing an episode of Spartacus. And by the way, same as you. I mean, I was always, um, you know, I, I watched some of them. And I thought, wow, what a what an amazingly well produced show. You know, the action was incredible. And uh, so I jumped at the at the opportunity. And by the way, this Spartacus, when I went to do that, it was shot in New Zealand. Was just before was. A month, I guess, or a month and a half before I was due to head off to South Africa to start work on Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, wow. Hence, when you see my character in there, the long hair, and they added some stuff because they wanted to shave my head. And at that stage, I said, I can't. I don't know what I'm supposed to look like for George Miller in Mad Max, even though, as you know, I was doing the fight coordinating, but I was also playing a role in Mad Max. So hence the look that came up. 
So off I went, and um, I tell you what, I was blown away with the professionalism, as I've already said, of the production. And there was there was an incredible amount of work that went into the sword play. They used to have boot camps, you know, that I wasn't a part of a whole lot of those. And luckily, I had some experience with weapons, of course, not so much this type of sword we would use in fighting, because as you know, weapons are weapons. So at least you've got an understanding of movement and choreography. But they had ridiculously long boot camps for the whole cast, you know, to, to again, make sure they looked skilled. They didn't look like they'd picked up a sword for the first time. And that just added to the, um, to the character and how much you believed. So I just went along, they, they choreographed stuff. Input, yes, I, I had a little bit of input into what, uh, to what my character was doing, which is always important because, as you know, a fight choreographer, and I go through this myself, I can choreograph what I do well. It doesn't mean that's what you do well. And it's very important when you choreograph to find out what the actor or the person playing the character can do. And they, of course, uh, did that with me. The, the gentleman I work with and did the sword fight with um, was just incredibly uh, professional and talented himself, not an athlete per se. But when you get actors that are just absolutely committed to their role, they'll just always pull it out of their hat, you know, when it comes to a performance. And he was a, he was an incredible adversary in that role. And I was supposed to be an ongoing character, I found out, but because I had to leave to start work on Fury Road, that ended up with my demise, you know, and I got, as you remember, I could kill with my own sword. That's <laughs> that little chestnut. <laughs> how, long did that, how long did that fight scene take with the swords compared to, you know, working in the past martial arts films and not even comparing them to Hong Kong films, but just basic films, how long would a fight scene take to, to shoot? Oh, I, I no, I need like a day and a half. I would think. See, they don't have time. You know, that's the difference with episodics, TV shows. They're on a schedule and it's like a freight train. You know, with a movie, you could go, as you know, a week over, depending on the budget. Some movies go months right. over and you have time to add texture to whatever you're doing. When it's a series, they're on such a tight schedule that you get what you get. They don't have time to muck around, you know, so the fights and everything are pretty much when the actor gets there, if you're not a part of the full-time crew and you've had a chance to learn choreography well before, once you jump off the plane, you've got a couple of days to get sort of into the mix of it. And then you've just got to be ready to shoot. So it was a very short amount of time. It might've been only a day. It's, it's hard to remember. They all sort of merged together after a while, but I do know I was just so happy with with the actual result of that that fight. Right, right. It was fantastic. Did did they shoot a mas a master and then come in for inserts or how did they do it? Yeah, generally, as much as you can, you shoot a master. Again, with that, we would have shot that in sections, and they, it's a bit, it's a little bit more like Hong Kong style, where they'll shoot a certain amount, and then they'll move the camera. And then, uh, in other words, they're almost editing as they go, which, by the way, is far better for us as performers because, as you would know, do a master of a fight like that nonstop is pretty hard and it's pretty taxing. What? you got to remember every move. And, again, a lot of the times they will do that because there'll be pieces they can use. You know what I mean? They, they kind of get the overall right. story of the fight and then most of the time they'll go in and get over the shoulder, insert shots and everything else and fix it up. But, yeah, I, I again, it's hard for me to remember exactly the steps of that shooting, but I, I think I remember it being in stages. But they already knew what the fight was going to be from start to finish, as opposed to when we talk about Hong Kong movies, they don't even know after the first half a dozen right. moves what the next moves are going to be. Hence, are taking a lot longer, you know. Well, that's nice. I, did you happen to work at all or have any scenes with Lucy Lawless by any chance? No, I didn't. No, no. Well, you know, it, it's kind of naive. Yeah, it's kind of naive for me because she's from Australia just to assume you might know her because it's a big country. It'd be, but uh, 
I know she did Xena, some other roles. I didn't know if your paths ever crossed in action films. No, no, they didn't. Of course, I knew of uh, Lucy, you know, from Xena. But I, I'm, I've got a feeling she was a Kiwi. I think she's a New Zealander. Oh, I, I'm oh, really I see. sure. Um, oh, I but see. no, I didn't. And I, I don't know whether I even knew she was involved in the series that much because I didn't know that much about Spartacus, you know, before going on it. It's sometimes wow. after the fact that you, you learn, you know, who was there and who you might have known and who also, as you say, would have been great to spend a bit of time with and meet. But I didn't get to do that yeah. with her. Oh, that that would have been awesome. I, I would have loved mm. that. I, You know, we were excited because there's millions of martial artists around the world and we expect our martial arts film stars to be in martial arts movies. But it's a little extra special when we see any of the our fans, I mean, any of our heroes that we like or stars that we like in mainstream movies like Spartacus. Mm -hmm. And Spartacus is a personal one of mine. That's the one I wish I could have been in myself. I, I followed all four years of the series and I followed it religiously. I loved all of it. And then, uh, like you said, you went to do Mad, uh, Mad Max. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mad Max, Furry Road. And uh, how long did that take to shoot? Oh, God. Well, I, I went over, I spent, um, I reckon, six weeks, two months before even pre-started over there because they sent me over to train, who knows, 80 different South African stunt people. I had to go over there and start to train them and, and get them ready for auditions because they needed to, we needed to train them up. And then I had a little audition scene, a fight scene that I would teach them and they had to be put on tape in order for George Miller to then decide if any of them were suitable for certain characters or where they would fit into the scene. So I was there, <coughs> excuse me, long before the uh, actual main shoot started. So I reckon I probably spent eight months over there and we shot that wow. in Swakamund, which is a, a town at, in in um, right down the bottom of Africa it used to be part of South Africa. It was a German colony. It used to be, hence the words Wakaman. And uh, an amazing experience, by the way, but this whole other story. So, yeah, I was there for probably eight months. And, you know, that, that the whole thing, the whole movie was supposed to be shot in Australia. In, in the areas that we shot the very last Mad Max that I worked on. But they'd been there for ages. They'd prepped the whole location and everything. And because it was supposed to be post-apocalyptic, no trees, no flowers, they had an area, you know, that you could drive in 100 k's and not see a plant. Well, they got unseasonable rains in this more of an outback area of Australia that caused grass and everything to turn green. Oh, so it was a sudden decision by the producers that this is not going to work. So they put all the vehicles, shipped them over to South Africa. And that's, that's why we ended up in that location, you know, in South Africa. Because when I, when I flew into this particular area and landed, it was like landing in Alice Springs. And Alice Springs for us is in the center of Australia. <coughs> There's no greenery. It's all barren and everything else. And I looked around, I couldn't see a tree, I couldn't see a plant. I thought, oh, God, no wonder they want to shoot here. But that's what prompted <laughs> the actual move and the actual shoot being in, uh, in South Africa. Well, I, I shot a film in uh, South Africa with John Barrett, uh, American Kickboxer 1, and it was plush. It was beautiful. Jungles and Johannesburg and Durban and all of that. So I can imagine... The difference, you know, what you're saying in there, because South Africa is so beautiful. Yeah, and and of course, even where we were, there were, were areas we had a lot of foliage and greenery and everything, but there were also just desert-like areas. You know, we worked in one of the, you know, the first. I guess they say it's the first deserts ever on Earth. Meaning, whatever happened with the climate, you know, that became one of the first arid sort of deserts. I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was. Um, but you had you also had greenery and everything else. But it was it was an amazing experience just to be in a place like I always you know as a kid wanted to go to Africa because I used to watch probably like you Tarzan movies and everything else and <laughs> I was just intrigued and loved the idea of being 
around and being able to see like elephants and rhino and yeah. buffalo and all that. And I remember we ended up going out on horseback in among zebra and wildebeest and, you know, no lions, by the way, in this particular area, thank God, because otherwise I mightn't be here now. But I just thought, again, who gets to do this? You know, I'm riding in, in among sort of African wildlife. Wow. Thought, wow. Wow. What an experience. Let me ask you. So you were one of the fight co uh, coordinators on, on the movie. Did you have a chance to work with uh, Nicholas Holt? Is that my, oh, I saying his last yes. name? Yeah. No, I love Nick. We're still good friends. You know, Nicholas, we, we spent a lot of time. That was one of his very early movies and, as you know, Nicholas's career has just taken off like a freight train. I'm a Wonderful. big fan of his. Uh, he's a beautiful soul too. He's a, he's the loveliest person, you know. And I um, I worked when I I I ended up a uh, funny story. I part of the training I think I did with Nicholas. We're doing a bit of grappling, and I did a particular move where I. It's a it's a takedown, do you know what I mean? But you control the arm. And I ended up, I guess, dropping it on his shoulder. And I didn't know till I saw him a year later that he it took six months for his shoulder to get better. And I felt so bad at that. Oh shit, that's that's a big no no, you know, considering the job I do that I'm here I am banging up one of the lead actors. But anyway. Yeah, that's a no no. You know, well anyway, I I followed a career because I saw him in the it was like the um the Jack and the Beanstalk or something like that. Remember he played that role where he goes up the Beanstalk. And I right. remember tell, telling my wife, Kathy, I said, that kid has it. He's going to be a star one day. He just has it, you know, and, and he did. He, I just watched this whole series with a TV series called the great, and he is fantastic in that. So I, I really admire the guy and I, I, that's wonderful. You worked with him. How about, did you have a chance to work with Tom Hardy at all? Oh yeah. Yeah, Definitely. Tom, that was a you know wonderful experience for me too because I I started working with Tom, training him up in Sydney, again when the film was just in very early pre-production, because you know as you know as a fight coordinator, part of my job is to get the actors up to speed with whatever the tools of action they're going to need. In this case, you know the. George had said that the character of Mad Max that Tom, of course, was now playing was not a martial artist. He was an ex-cop, ex-military. So the skill set had to be very, very street-like, very real, you know, which suits me. So I started training Tom and uh, got him into jiu-jitsu. One of the first ones to start training Tom in jiu-jitsu. And I don't know whether you know we're digressing now, but Tom's recently competed as a blue belt in a number of jujitsu tournaments. He did one not that long ago and won gold with gi and no gi, which blew me away because again, I, I was one of the first to sort of roll with, with Tom and he's just run with that. He's training in England. And again, you talk about passion. He's passionate about grappling now, you know? So cut two, I was, he was even, he loved it so much. He was even, sneaking out of script meetings with George Miller. He said, God, God, let's do some more jits, as he calls it, you know? <laughs> he, he just loved the idea of, of the grappling art. And again, it's it's carried on to this day. So that's pretty exciting. And he's he's a, he's a very interesting character. He's very intense, Tom. I mean, he's, he's the type of actor that if you get on the set, he will break down every moment of every scene. He, you have to justify why that person is looking and why they're standing in that direction, blah, 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 you know, before he would actually commit to a scene. And then he's just 100% committed. And uh, as I said, very intense and obviously an incredible actor, you know, with, with what he does. Same with Charlize. Well, Charlize I Theron was the same with Mad Max. I mean, so committed, worked so well with Charlize. They're, they're very different in the way they perform. I mean, Tom... He's more method. He wants to, again, break down every aspect, whereas Charlize is like with the tanker scene, for instance. She says, all I want to do is fucking kill him. Let's roll the camera. Do you know what I mean? She has a simple <laughs> want as an actor, and she, she then just dives headlong in. She doesn't like going through beat by beat by beat and figuring it all out. She's, she's gifted in a whole different way. 
Let me ask you about Tom Hardy, going back to him first. I was going to ask you about if you had an influence on his Brazilian jiu-jitsu because I saw online where he entered a tournament and did really well. And then mm-hmm. also he played the warrior, a, mar- a movie about MMA fighter. Was that after you or before you? No, be- warrior was a bit before me. So he, so you're right. He'd had a taste of it all, but hadn't actually, you know, of course, choreography wise. And I think you remember that a lot of what he did in warrior wasn't detailed grappling, you know, right. it was usually one punch or one move or whatever. Right. So in Sydney, when we were training together, that's when he got to delve in a little more deeply into the art of jujitsu. And as I said, loved. And I've got to say, you know, when I saw the fact that he'd competed and won in two divisions, I thought, hats off to you, Tom. I mean, you're a mega star. You know yourself, we right. talked about this last time, daring to participate. It takes a lot for him to step out on the mat, knowing everybody would know who the hell he was, and be okay with that. Be okay with the every chance that he could have lost in 20 seconds of the first match. As it turned out, he didn't, and he actually won some medals. But I thought for him to be able to put his ego aside and just get on that mat and, and just dare to be the best he can be, I, I just thought that was incredible. You know, I, I really admired that in, in him and what he did with that. Yeah, and you're right. The Warrior, I've seen probably five times. I love that film. He had no semblance of Brazilian jiu-jitsu in there. He was just a rough and tumble boxer. He was just yeah. really just rough around the edges and mean, and he's so intense in every role he ever plays. Whereas the beautiful Charlize Theron, I think, besides Cynthia Rothrock, I think in Angelique Jolie, maybe she's the best I've ever seen portrayed on film doing martial arts or kicks or punches. She played an atomic, um, what was that, atomic, atomic warrior atomic or something? Blonde. Atomic blonde and was the film she did. Atomic blonde over after her. She was so dynamic and powerful in that film because she, when she executes her techniques, they're extended. They're not short. And I'm going, how can she look better on film than me. That's what I keep thinking. I go, how could she look better than half the people I've seen on film? She really looks great on film and powerful too. And we talked about it before. Some of the women sometimes have a hard time displaying power, not her. She is powerful on film. So I bet it was a joy working with her. Did did, did she really enjoy the, the tumbling and working out and going through all of that as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. But it's like I say, Keith, about a lot of these uh, people that have achieved so much in their careers, it's their level of commitment. You know, when you train someone like Charlize or like Tom, they're so committed to being the best version of them, they don't just half do it, you know. And and they're such incredible actors. And, And you would know, too, your intent when you got up to fight, remember you visualized, you saw yourself winning no matter what, you know, your idea that this opponent has no idea what he's about to experience. I'm paraphrasing what you said to me. And I think that's what I see with the actors. Like, you know, a martial artist can can throw a punch and you go, well, you're just really showing me the shape of that punch or a form or a kick. And there's others, like a Benny or Kid, is when they put their gaze on you, even though they're throwing a control technique, you go, fuck me, you know, the only thing missing is the actual contact because the intent and that that grit to deliver that with so much believability is there. And I think good actors have the ability to not just deliver lines, you know, that makes you believe everything they're saying, but their physicality, you end up believing everything they do because they're just in the moment, they're so committed, they're prepared. And I think that's what you see with someone like Charlize or Tom or Scarlett Johansson or a Margot Robbie, you know, I, again, I say they're just all so damn committed that when you train them, they're not doing it because some producers told them they have to. When you give them direction or information, you can see they're hanging on every word and they're processing it. Wow. Do you know what I mean? Which is very different from something, oh, I don't want to do this shit, you know, just right. let my stuff. I think it's, an, I think it's very enjoyable for them as well. I think it's, it's expanding their horizons. And I think all of it, because most people around the planet love martial arts 
and those who get involved in it, they love it. But just the fact that you're doing an action scene, I think, you know, even when they were children, they were going, I'd love to be in an action film and and do what I've seen, Tarzan or whatever the case might be. And and now they're getting the chance to do that with you. And so I bet it's so fun for them. And then well, now moving ahead with Men Max, there's more to come with Men Max, more, shit, more movies, you think? Or can you talk about them? <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, you know, we just we finished the the latest installment, uh, Furiosa. It is called. Uh, we finished that. I don't know how long ago, Judy. Six months, whatever. Six months ago, we had a big shoot, all shot in Australia this time. Um, and it's really the story is about how Charlize Theron's character became Furiosa, as she was called in Fury Road. So Mad Max doesn't feature in this particular one. You know, it's all about her journey. And because it's a prequel, it's apparently 10 years earlier, you know, than than Fury Road and the character you saw. They ended up casting Anya Taylor-Joy as Furiosa, meaning the younger Charlize Theron character. And she was amazing because I think um, Anya's probably 25, 26 years of age. Um, wow. And, you know, so again, it's, it's, it's a prequel, as I said, and, and it's going to be amazing, Keith. I mean, anything George Miller does, there's no, there's no yeah. second gear. It's, it's just full on, you know. It's the it's biggest movie that's ever been shot here in Australia, that's for sure. And for those who don't know, Anya Taylor-Joy, and I'm, I'm sure they do now because she's doing so much stuff, she was in the Peaky Blinders series, you know, but she was also uh, in... With Tom Hardy, Chester. yep. Yeah, so she's the lead. Chris Hemsworth is the main villain uh, in wow. the movie. Yeah, and um, in what a, he's, he's going to be incredible in this because he's, I don't know, he's given it a real Aussie, almost a comedic flair, you know, because George, George loves to have eccentric-type characters in movies like Mad Max, and this is not going to be any different. And I, I got to laugh because I, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with Chris because, it, first of all, what can you teach him? He's done every bit of action anyway. Do you know what I mean? The guy is so incredible. And as you know, he's got um, uh, Extraction 2 that's out on Netflix. And anyone who watches him say, well, shit, he's as good as any of us could ever be, you know, in delivering action <laughs> on camera. But I, I laugh because Judy, after a few weeks, she said, oh, have you met Chris Hemsworth yet? And I said, yeah, yeah, I met him, met him a few days ago. And she said, oh, how was it? I said, fuck him. And she's laughing. She said, what do you mean, fuck him? I said, fuck him. I said, he's six foot four. You know, he's built like a brick shit house, you know, and he's right. got this deep voice. I said, he's even got perfect skin. And she laughed. She said, oh, you even notice he had perfect skin. I said, who needs all of that? You know, I said, fuck him. <laughs> I, I said, if, I know, if I every one of us would want to be a Chris Hemsworth, you know. I saw some girls in some of the shows talking about it, meeting him. And then they found out he could sing too. And they hated him. They said, oh, my God. And you can sing? I and mean, is that can... fair? That's not even fair and, to the rest of his mortals. And he's the nicest guy you could ever meet. I had a number of conversations with him about breathing, you know, the exercise routine he has and all of that. He's the loveliest guy. He's, he's great with anybody and everybody that he's around on a set. So once again, I say, fuck him. Who needs all this? There's got to be some <laughs> floor. I just haven't found it yet. <laughs> well, you know, Mad Max blew me away because they had those, those poles you know, coming out of the automobiles and they go to the top. That's never been done before. It's hard to do something never been seen before. Were there injuries? Or was that wild? I mean, any stories about that? That that totally blew everybody away. Yeah, there, there, there's always injuries of some sort, you know. But, you know, that, that whole thing came from, I'm not sure whether, Guy Norris is the stunt coordinator, second unit director. He's been on every Mad Max movie. And I've worked with Guy for like 30 years. I'm not sure whether it's him, but it, it may be, and apologies, Guy, if it wasn't you or if it was you, but he, they saw uh, it was Chinese circus performers that were running up these poles, you know, and in a particular uh -huh. show or whatever they'd seen, and that's where that idea spawned from. And we were all 
that was going to be the main stunt of the movie because like you said it was so different so we were sworn to secrecy not to even mention anything about the prep for that scene you know the fact that they put them on moving vehicles there was a lot of training went into they even had pole dancers come in and teach a stunt guide how to climb a pole oh, how to hang on to it and all of this sort of stuff because oh. not easy especially on a vehicle sorry my wife just says i didn't tell her that bit about pole dancers oh sweetie i must have forgotten to mention that she's part of the job love <laughs> anyway there was a lot of work in the in the training these people and and uh what an incredible scene i remember being on set the first time seeing it actually happening they started like almost seemed like the little dots and these vehicles just started driving the waters and you see this pole doing this and these dudes on top of them and it it was such an amazing image to see and as you know the whole idea of that was how could these attack vehicles actually get onto the tanker right right what an ingenious way to have that have them on these these flexible poles and uh we we did have one of one one of my dear friends who played one of the pole cats they were called did uh the 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 vehicle exited one of the scenes uh, to cut it it exited in a way that wasn't rehearsed hit some rough road he was at the top of that pole and fell off that onto a very very hard dirt road ended up you know breaking quite a number of bones you know it was quite a heavy right. injury but but that was standard you know when you were in mad max and you know i on the first one of course playing the one of the imperators i was lucky i was in one of the lead vehicles because if you were in any of the vehicles behind you couldn't see past your hand with the amount of dust and everything being thrown up from the vehicles you're following so i always we always said shit if somebody and there were a lot of stunties that were strapped on the different vehicles because they're outside on top of and everything else if anyone fall enough you wouldn't know it until you felt the bump going over the top of them because you wouldn't <laughs> be able to see it so well, there was always an incredible incredible amount of risk with doing those sort of stunts which by the way as i think we mentioned the last time made the film and the mad max film so incredible because it was what we term old school action meaning every stunt was a real stunt person actually putting their lives on the line performing a stunt which gave it such a a, ver a, a grounded sort of visceral re realness you know to what you were seeing <coughs> right so instead of being having a pole green screen in, the, in a sound stage they were really on those poles driving around that really it blew well. everybody away because we had no one had ever seen that before we've mm -hmm. seen how many car scenes have you seen and chase scenes probably everybody's seen hundreds of them that just it just captivated you couldn't even believe what you were seeing so that, yeah. How about, have you had that? And again, this is a, a crazy question. One of my biggest uh, guys I like in films is Mel Gibson. He started the Mad Max. Have they mm. ever thought about writing somehow to get him brought back in or in flashbacks or whatever? Or is he just totally divorced from all the Mad Maxes? Good question. I don't really know the answer. I, there was always a, a bit of a whisper going around that he might be in like a little cameo somewhere it it didn't happen obviously and i'm sure i would have known right. if it did but no i don't know i don't know the backstory to all of that right. you know i guess yeah everybody would love that but as you know it's like batman like you can have a variety of actors play batman it's about batman the, the character as opposed to the actor that's right. playing it or exactly. superman i think Max has got to be like that. That was okay to bring a Tom Hardy in, and who knows if they do another one, which I believe there's a script written, it could be another actor again. It's the same as having Anya Taylor right. Joy play a young Charlize Theron, you know. Well, I just want to talk about one more, uh, and it's uh, um, the Squid. Um, I'm sorry, Suicide Squads. I don't know why I say Squid. Suicide Squads. There was a couple of them. I don't know where Squid <laughs> came from, but those movies were so just out of the or ordinary as well. But I don't think Margot at the time, Robbie was as big a star as she is now. So uh, how was she to work with? She seems to be a delightful person. Uh, you know, you, I couldn't be a bigger fan, Keith, you know, not just because of her 
ability on camera, but just her as a person. <clears throat> as I said, she's the loveliest, loveliest lady you could ever work with. You know, she's in Australia. We say she's just the girl next door. You know, she's so down to earth, right. so unaffected, so committed as I the word I keep using all the time with what she's doing. And uh, she's just delightful. You know, uh, you know, I'd mentioned we spent uh, a bit of time with Margot a few years back, met at a pub in LA, my wife and I, and I, what struck me when we met was that most people wouldn't have even known it was Margot because she was just so underdressed, hardly any makeup. In other words, there was no, oh, gee, I have to walk in and be a movie star. She was just so regular, you know, and I ended up walking her home because she was staying at a friend's house and sleeping on their couch. You know, I said, what the fuck? You know, how does that work? But that's the sort of person she was. And I said, look, you can't walk home by yourself. I'll, I'll walk you home. And it, again, I just remember thinking, what, what a down to earth, just lovely human being, you know, polite. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't say enough about Margot. And, you know, it, the great thing was getting to sort of train Margot for, for many, many hours, you know, put the boxing gloves on. She loved boxing. We got her into jujitsu, you know, for the first one. And um, she, she just took to that like a, you know, duck on water. And um, yeah, it's, it was just a joy working with her. Well, you were the fight coordinator for that film, those films as well, right? Yes. So did you train any of the, it was just full of actors. I can't even name all of them. There's so many of them. Did you train any of the other actors? Yeah, well, I spent I spent oh, a couple of months with Will Smith training Will at his house, you know, playing the character Deadshot. And uh, again, what a delight, you know, that was, you know, it, he, he I just think a world of Will and we trained hard, taught him a lot of grappling. Um, you know, again, getting back to my job is to sort of work out what the character is, what's the skill set that character would need to have and then try and keep whatever training it is very pertinent to what I think they're going to need as the character. Because again, as I would say to them, I don't have time to teach you to be a martial artist or a right. full on MMA fighter or whatever. So again, it had to be quite specific to what they would need to do. And I mean, think about that, Keith, you know, what a job, right, mate, you know, that you get to spend time a couple of months at Will Smith's house or training Margo or training, Scarlett Johansson. I mean, how many people get to do that? And in a world that is ours, meaning a martial arts world, a combat world that we love. I mean, life doesn't get better than that. So I've been very fortunate, you know, with that point of view. What you, what you worked with uh, Scarlett Johansson, what movie was that for? Ghost in the Shell. I had oh to go gosh. to New York. Yeah, I went to, they sent me to New York to train her for a, a month right. or two then Los Angeles, and then ended up in New Zealand. I wasn't the fight coordinator on that one. Timmy Wong was, who's ended up being fight uh, stunt coordinator on, you know, the Mad Max movies and such. But he was a fight coordinator. But I was, again, just to get her into shape and get her ready. So I went to New York, took her to a gun range. It was only one of the one gun ranges they had in New York so she could get live fire practice to know what it felt like, you know, to shoot an actual weapon, you know, with with bullets and everything else. And in took it to a little uh, Wing Chun Academy I found in, in New York, you know, and uh, we did a lot of training and rehearsal. They would send me notes, you know, with what they felt the fight scenes were going to look like. So I would know again each day what was best to train Scarlet in. And same thing, you know, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but it, it just... You know, they're just lovely people. You know, they're just a joy to be around. It's not a job. It's like you're just training one of your best friends, you know, who love to be doing what they're doing just as much as you do. And uh, Scarlett ended up doing probably 85% of all her own stuff in Ghost in the Shell, which, by the way, is quite different because when she did the Marvel films, you know, and played a character, she really didn't do anything. They do... They have a stunt double do it, and then they put face replacement. They'll put her face in a stunt double. So oh, I didn't know that. Our, our, our intent, and Guy Norris, you know, always his whole sort of credo is that 
we want the actor to be able to do good 80% of everything. Now, of course, there's some dangerous stunts you wouldn't allow them to do even if they wanted to because of the risk of injury. But as far as fight action, we said to them, you're the, you're the award-winning actors. We need you to be on camera. So there's co no compromise with the way the director needs to cover or shoot the fights. And, and that was always our aim. The choreography as a result was always then in my mind, tailored to suit their abilities rather than always having scenes that would need so much work from a professional stunt person. And I, I think that's what makes a lot of those films work because even though it might be might be as complex as some of the Marvel films and Avengers and all that sort of stuff, it was still boots on the ground and quite real and quite acceptable to an audience because it was real. I mean, you know, with Scarlet or Margo or Will or whatever, just doing their own action and performing their own stunts, which just, I think, makes the character that much more believable. Well, your career has expanded from, it's gone from stunts to fight choreography, stunt coordinator, to actor, to star, uh, second unit director, to consultant, to working with these people. If you had to choose one, which has had been your favorite in your entire career, which, which have you enjoyed the most? Or is it apples and oranges and you just can't pick one? You know, from acting, starring, or working with these great celebrities? Yeah, I still would. I still like the idea of acting more. You know, the the fight coordinating and doing all that stuff came as a result, as you know, of, of starting in lower budget action movies, being on the set and having to learn as you go. The acting being a almost a side skill that you had to pick up as you went, because we, you know, we were martial artists. You know, when I started acting, I'd never studied acting. It was only when I got on set and realized, as per Octagon, how much was into delivering a line that I started doing acting classes. But I, just, I, because it was sort of a bit out of my comfort zone being in front of a camera as an actor, that really excited me. The, the action part was kind of what I did anyway, you know, every day in right. the dojo, albeit different because it's on camera. So I think the excitement of taking on a new challenge in, as far as, as portraying a character and everything that goes with that, that excited me. It still does now, you know. It, you know, the older you get, of course, the less roles there are. I used to laugh and say at our age, you're either playing an aging gangster or somebody's grandfather or whatever. So I ended up being more behind the camera, you know, doing the fight stuff. And and I'm absolutely fine with that because I'm still involving my martial arts and my passion. And there's not many people that, that get a chance like I've had, like you've had to actually do that. So I still feel very blessed. But by the way, I've still, you know, there's a couple of leads that I've been cast in, so I will be acting more. One of the, one of the roles is a bullet awaits you. It's, it's actually an animation. We did a test scene, two weeks ago, it's a Western and it's a phenomenal script and I'd never done animation, you know, I, I'm, I didn't even know that it is. So I had to go in the studio. You have a little cell phone on your face that monitors every line, every movement of your mouth and everything else. And they create an animated character. So it'll look like me, but again, animated and, I had a test scene they sh showed me, you know, uh, of what that sort of thing can look like. And I couldn't believe how enthralled I was with the performances, even though you're not looking at an actual person, it's still an actor that delivered that performance. So I'm right. playing the lead in that. And I'm just so frigging excited about what that's going to turn into. It's in the very early stages, but. And, and the funny, the and you know what the best best part is, Keith. I got to tell you, they wanted me to send headshots of what I looked like when I was in thirty, because the character's supposed to be in his late twenties or thirty. So I get no Botox or anything. I get to be thirty again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great! Uh, can yeah. you do? Do they have a working title for that, or that might change? Or 
Yeah, I think it's a bullet awaits you. It, and again, it's a Western, it's, you know, he's in the Confederate Army or whatever. It's, you know, it's an American. Sounds good. I like the title. Sort of oh, man, it's so exciting. And there's some great well, shit in there. And I can't wait to do it. And you said you but you have another one, too. Maybe you might be working yeah, on there's a, anything there's you can talk about. There's called Last Call, uh, where the character is a retired cop who's now running a bar, you know, and all the goings on in, in this very rough neighborhood it's supposedly set it was set in a, in a neighborhood in the bronx for instance you know in new york i did suggest that maybe that's a little difficult with all the characters having to sound very authentic you know east coast and everything so they have changed it to a bar that will be in australia now you know Oh. But again, a lot of lot of fights and everything in action and very boots on the ground, very combat ready sort of action, not not people flying around the room on wires or anything like that. So <laughs> it's a great character. And again, we that's on the back burner until we get the animation show uh, done. But that's coming up. And and as you know, who knows, we've still got Black Creek, you know, which we talked about, right. Cynthia's movie at the end of the year. So it's exciting. There's still some acting roles coming up and, and right. shit, mate, I'm 73, you know, to be still actually on the set involved in anything is, is, is wonderful. Well, you know, I think you work more than the average actor in, in Hollywood. And I'm kind of naive when I say Hollywood, because a lot of the roles are not from Americans at all, from all over the world, like you and Charlize and all these other actors from all over the world, New Zealand, especially so many come on out of, of Britain, so many great, you know, from England. And, you know, so have you ever, ever thought about directing yourself? Yeah, I'd love to do that, actually. I mean, I, you know, and I had a couple of opportunities that didn't sort of pan out, but I, I would love the idea because, and I'll tell you why, it's only because what a great challenge, you know, that's the next step. And because I've been on so many movie sets and been around so many phenomenal directors, you can't help but learn that doesn't mean I could pull it off. Who the hell knows? But I would love to give it a shot. It's a bit like, you know, when you talk about working with the actors and doing fight choreography, I think one of the skills I bring, aside from being physically able to teach them martial arts skills, because there's a lot of people that could do that, is the fact that I've had to act. Now, let me say before any in the audience go, well, you're not that good. Richard, you know, but we get by and you still, you do what you can. And I've learned so much about what it takes to deliver a line, right. whether it comes out mediocre or not. So when I get with, with actors like Amago or whatever, I understand the drama side of what they're trying to do. And, you know, we have a saying that, that a fight scene is non, it's non-verbal dialogue. In other words, you're, even though you're not talking with him in a fight, you're still telling a story. There's a coming from what happened that initiated that fight. You know, what's the relationship of who this, the lead is now fighting or not. And that's drama, you know, to understand the emotion of getting hit. You know, I once said to Scarlett, if I slapped you in the face right now, you would have an emotional response. You might be pissed off. You might be like, what the fuck? You might be scared or whatever. In other words, there's this drama within the beats of a fight. And I feel that's what I'm able to do is help them understand that emotional journey, whether it's a gunfight, you can imagine, you know, with Scarlett, that's why we went to a gun range. Because they said, if you get on set, you can't be blinking a little startled when you fire, albeit a, a blank. Nowadays, it won't even be a blank. But back then, we had blank rounds. I said, your character has been doing this since they were this high. So you have to be so natural with your delivery and the way you aim and the way you shoot and everything right. else, hence taking to a, to a live fire range. And again, you, you, I'm, I'm overstating it now, but the emotional journey, I feel I have a better understanding than I believe a lot of stunt people would, you know, and I think that's an asset, you know. Well, here's what I think. It's way too late now because I just thought of it now, but if I had uh, spoken with Cynthia before she even started her Kickstarter campaign and raising funds and trying to get a movie, I would have suggested you to direct it because when I interviewed who are her, I told her, I said, you got a cast of characters. You got a lot of top 
martial artist there. And I hope the director's strong and knows what he's doing and the fight choreographer, whoever that might be, because these are all people who know what they're doing. And I'm, mm-hmm. and I hope he's going to accept some of their input, but I think everybody would have given you the respect to, to run Ramshot over all of them and control them in a way that I don't know if this, whoever this director is, he probably is the greatest director of all time, but he's got his hand full with, with about 10 of the, of the leading martial arts and, uh, uh, actors out there and I'm talking about Billy Blanks and Oliver Gruner and all these great guys and you and and Billy you know and Benny Urquidez and here's this director's going to say let me tell you I think I know best and all of you are going to go I've done five movies with Jackie Chan you know you're what you're thinking in the back of your head so wow. you know I'm sure I wish him the best and I know he's going to do well but you would have been my first choice to direct that film and how oh, wonderful would you. that have been to have you direct yeah. that that have been that have been great no, thank you, Keith. Yeah, and also a whole lot of martial art egos. You know what that would be like. Well, I know. And you would have <laughs> to control wants that to because. Be told, you know, yeah, it's like hurting cats. You might not want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and, no, and I, am, I, I get what you're saying. And it's, it's hard. Yeah. You, you know, the one thing I do know being on yeah. sets is a lot of the actors I've been around, and I, 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 I have a chance to observe a lot, whether it's a Tom with a George Miller, Charlie for George Miller, Margot with. James Gunn, whatever, there's abs- the actor has to have absolute trust in the director if they're going right. to take on direction, right. and that's that's paramount. So I, I totally get what you're saying. You know, it's right. it's right. A, to helm a, a, an action film without being an actual action person is difficult. But I would say that I also get having been around. Well, let's say George Miller. George, Doctor George is not a martial artist. He's not. He doesn't do action. He's like though the director needs to be like the conductor of an orchestra. If you look at exactly the conductor of an orchestra, they don't know how to play the trombone and the clarinet and everything else. Their job is to just make sure it's all in tune. Do you know what I mean? That the notes gel, right. and that's really what a good director does. He doesn't have to know the actual bits, but he understands the whole thrust of a scene the reality, the feel he wants from it. And, you know, that's, that's what the great dudes do. You know, James Gunn, he's not a, he's, he doesn't do action as in physically right, in right. his own life, but his ability to understand how that scene needs to evolve and what the end result needs to be, because it's all in their heads. They're editing, they're picturing it as, especially if they happen to be the writer as well as a director. That's always, I think, a very important part that leads to a, a really good conclusion, you know, to an action film. Do you know if Black Creek has um, a fight coordinator who's choreographing, putting the fight sequences together, probably different than the director. I couldn't imagine the director not being a martial arts, putting the fight sequences together or Cynthia may be doing that. Uh, I would think it's a combination of all of that, but I believe there is a team she's, but Cynthia is bringing in. I want oh, to right. talk out of turn. But I think it might even be a Swiss team or whatever that she really liked that she'd either right, work from Germany. Or, I think from Germany or Switzerland Germany. or someplace. That's right. Maybe yeah. yes. So so they'll come in. Look at you know, and as you know, it's a it's a collaborative process. Everybody just has to be right. has to be okay with being directed, you know, with being molded because of course, you know, if I'm doing a fight scene, of course I want to do what I want to do because I feel more comfortable. I don't want to be asked to do something that I feel uncomfortable with. But I also have to realize that as uncomfortable as them, that may be the best stroke for that particular part of an action scene, you know, and you have to right. trust there's only one captain of the ship, you know what I mean? And you get good directors, and again, like a George Miller, they will they will listen, oh, oh, what do you think? And da, da, da. they'll take the input, they'll go through in their heads, and then they'll go, okay, this is what we're going to do. And at that stage, everybody has to go, aye, aye, captain. Because if you don't, it's a mess. You can't have, oh, yeah. you know, five directors on a movie set. And and just to say, you remember like working in Hong Kong, you know, there's always two directors. The action director takes over, you know, with the films I did, like Magic Crystal, you had Wong Jing who would do the drama and then he basically handed over to the second unit director who was the acting director and he would then take the helm and uh, that's just the way it worked and it worked really well that way. 
rather than over there leave it to a director that didn't have experience or actual knowledge of action. But it's different. You know, it's a little different in America, but right. yeah. Yeah, I, I apologize. I remember now because I did ask Cynthia about it, and uh, she said she's bringing down a team from Germany. And I remember we all went together to that con um, film festival that we all went together. And we had maybe eight, ten of, of just fantastic people all going. What a wonderful time. And I remember seeing a, a team of these Germans put on a demonstration, and they were incredible. So mm. I know there's a lot of talent there. So uh, they're going to have to be, because I was trying to be diplomatic where they're going. Do you know you're going to have to have a strong personality to deal with Don Wilson and Keith Hirabashi and Oliver Gruner? And I mean, on and a Benny Yukitas. I went, I want to see the person who's going to stand up going, I know best because it's the best of all time standing right in front of them. So, but I, yeah, I think yeah. this team's going to be, I think they'll do a fine job. And, and the people involved in the film all have great attitudes. So I, I, I'm predicting the best for. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Me too. And as I said, you, you, this is part, yes, you have input, but you've got to be able to put your ego aside. And, and again, as right. I said before, allow yourself to be directed because you will often only see it from your point of view. You know, there's a, there's a funny, probably heard the old thing of when you get a script, bullshit, 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 my line, my line, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> Meaning all you're really looking at is what you're going to do and how you're going to come across. So you can often right. miss the whole picture, as it were. You right. know? And right. good directors will always take input, and I believe, anyway. They'd be stupid if they didn't, you know, to, to just assess everything. It's like right. Octagon. You know, I always laugh, you know, when we brought up Octagon being one of my first movies, you know, I was working... I had to play Keo, as we talked about, the Crimson Mask Enforcer, but I was also long legs, you know, a terrorist, you know, I had the blonde hair and the moustache. And there was, I, re, I was actually working, you know, I was bodyguarding John Belushi at the time that I got the script. And I said, John, have a look at this. He had a look at it. He's the one that actually came up. I don't know, you probably won't remember specifically, but it starts off with, me telling everybody to sit down and give a little speech. There's a bit of an altercation with Chuck Norris's character and myself. And I, he goes to walk away and I put my hand on his shoulder and I say, you go when I tell you or something to that effect. And he lifts his heel up and kicks me in the groin. Well, John Belushi is the one that came up with that bit of choreography. He said, no, when he kicks you in the groin, just go, oh, shit, shit, and just spin around in a circle with your hand up. And then, of course, he ends up sort of kicking me in the head. And I always laugh because how good is that? That John Belushi actually choreographed, in a sense, the beginning of that action scene. And, you know, the, Eric Carson, the director, was, was happy to go with it. So it's a bit of an example. You never know where the input's going to come from, what's, what, how it ended up being that way on screen. <laughs> well, that you know, I want to segue into some of your celebrities you worked with, John Belushi. That it doesn't fit the pattern of all the you know the Rolling Stones and and all the other Stevie Nicks and all those that you worked uh, James Taylor and um, how do you get involved with of all people John Belushi? You know, uh, as you know, I worked with Linda Ronstadt. I started working with Linda in nineteen seventy eight, right, and. Um, most of those guys, James Taylor and all of them, always ended up doing Saturday Night Live. You know, it That's was right. like probably the favorite show for anybody to be on as a performer or, or even an actor to host or whatever. So Linda ended up being a guest on Saturday Night Live. And I was in the dressing room in New York, you know, on the set. And I was, I used to like before a show, or whatever, just stretch her out a bit, warm her up and everything else. And John Belushi walked in. And I'd never met him. That's how I first met John. And I'm, I'll cut the story short, but due to him realizing that I'm Linda Ronstadt's bodyguard, and we're, I was the only one he wanted after that. You know, he ended up getting in touch with me, wanted me to go out on tour with the Blues Brothers when they went on their musical tour and everything. So I, I just, he just, he was just adamant that he wanted me to be his bodyguard and also ended up training him, you know, to try and get him in shape and lose a bit of weight and everything else. So I ended up 
working with John on the Blues Brothers movie, which again is another story of how, what an incredible sort of journey, you know, my martial arts has taken me on because I'm on the Blues Brothers set. I get to meet Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles and people like this, you know, and of course, you know, it's just ridiculous, you know, and I actually, and there's a scene in the Blues Brothers movie where a nun comes down the stairs and she's got, it's like a cane or an umbrella or something. I ended up choreographing that. They want to know, John Landis was a director. Oh, what could she do? And I ended up giving, it's almost like a kendo move as she comes down the stairs. <laughs> You'd have to see the movie to even remember what it was. And But that was a little bit of my input is working on, on the Blues Brothers movie. And actually it was after that they were going out on the road as, as the Blues Brothers band with Danny Aykroyd uh, and John literally said, I'm not going to do it unless you go out with me, which I said, God, that's a bit extreme. And that's how Bill Wallace ended up getting the job because I thought I've got to find somebody else. I said, I'll get somebody else to be great. And because one of the or a couple of the band had either grown up or lived in Memphis and I knew Bill was from that whole side of the country, I ended up suggesting Bill cut two. Bill became John Belushi's bodyguard and trainer because I was already committed to working with Fleetwood Mac and James Taylor and Linda and I couldn't actually go out on the road you know with John and the whole band so that's another story and by the way cut to another interesting part of that you know I don't know whether you know that when John passed away at the Chateau Marmont the Chateau Marmont was a famous hotel in like almost service apartment type hotel in Los Angeles just off Doheny and uh, of of, um, Sunset Boulevard, we all stayed there. The bands always stayed there when they went. It was the place to stay. Well, Bill was working with John Belushi when he unfortunately, Bill was the one that found John unconscious in his room, gave him actual PCR, external heart massage, tried to revive him. Of course, he couldn't. But yeah, how about that? That's that's wow. quite a historical moment that, that built, is a built historical moment and tried to revive John actually in one of the rooms in the Chateau Marmont. But a bit of history, you know. Another sorry to go on, but I also laugh. No, and no, I'm no, keep doing it. I think I love John. You know, he was just it had a heart of gold. You know, when I was re- working with him, he his wife at the time, her name was Judy. I'd go to John's house in LA with his team. I'd go in. I'd wake him up because he'd sleep in in all hours. I put Judy on the phone. John, wake up at your wife, Judy. Hey, hey. And then <clears throat> it starts snoring away, go back to sleep, and I'd have to wake him up and say, come on, it's your wife, wake up. I ended up, I visited uh, John and Bill when they were doing a workout at, a, I forget the studio, but it was a Taekwondo school, and I walk in. Bill's going up, and you remember Bill with his kicks up in the air. So Bill's got John going up and down to the dojo throwing round kicks that were probably as high as my kneecap. Bill's up in the air doing this. John's moving along, kicking his high. And I remember John stopped and looked at me and said, yeah, I'm going to use this in my next fight. <laughs> it, was just, it was just so funny to see the Dan contrast Aykroyd, did- characters, you know? Yeah. Did you work out with Dan Aykroyd as well or train with him? No, I didn't. No, I was just with uh, John. Of course, you know, I got to spend a bit of time with Dan, but it was all with John. And, yeah, we we, we just got on so well. I, I loved him. He, again, heart of gold, that guy, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was, was a great experience. Well, and I, I know you worked with Linda uh, Ronstadt for a long time, and she's one of my favorites. She was beautiful, had a beautiful voice, and, and she just was just incredible. Was, was, did he go all over the world touring with her as well? Yes, I did. Yeah, as I said, I ended up working on and off with Linda for about 14 years. Um, oh, my goodness. She was the reason I went to the States in the first place. You know, I because we worked on a tour. Bob Jones and I worked on a tour here in Australia in 78. And uh, Linda, the following year, ended up calling me up and wanting to know if I would go and work for full-time for her in the U.S. And I remember at the time I had karate school, had a girlfriend, I was very settled, and I was like, oh, 
and cut two. And I think I mentioned this in the last interview. She was the one that said to him, look, why don't you try it? You can always go back home. I think I mentioned that. So I off I went, as I said before, I don't, I can't imagine what my life would have been had I not dared to step out of my little comfort zone Australia and go to the U S because everything is a result of that. And Linda invited me over to work for her. I ended up working with Linda and James Taylor. Uh, I was with him for 14 years as well because they both had the same manager and Peter Asher we used to have Peter Asher management. So I worked with both of them. And of course, having worked with bands like Fleetwood Mac, I ended up working with Fleetwood, I ended up working with David Bowie for eight years. There was a whole, you know, sort of a melting pot of, of different artists that I was fortunate enough to work with. Linda, of course, and James is just, uh, you know, just love them to death, you know, with, with the opportunities they gave me, you know, with, with being in the United States and of course, ending up getting a film career just by the mere fact that I was there. I think I mentioned, I called Chuck Norris as soon as I got to Australia, cause we'd met him a year before in Australia, right. started training with him, the rest is history. And that started my film career. And I, I did personal bodyguard work up until the early nineties, you know, it was a, a long time. And, and Keith, I'm on the road with, with some of the biggest rock and roll bands of their time in the eighties and nineties, as I say to people, it doesn't get better than that. I mean, traveling the world with, with bands like that, with what went on and everything, it was just an amazing world and, and around some of the greatest musicians you'll, you'll ever get to know. The Rolling Stones. I mean, I just couldn't imagine being at a better time in history. And and when you would work out with all of them, would they want to just get in shape or spend time or bodyguard? Or did any of them have the desire to, to learn some martial arts at the same time? Would you show them a, a technique here and there? Yeah, no, absolutely independent. But I, I was never hired as their trainer per se. That just it was always something I suggested, you know, like I ended I up you. teaching Mick Jagger at, and I've said this a lot of so times, sometimes at four o'clock in the morning after concert, teaching him reverse punches and things like this. He was quite intrigued, incredibly fit and healthy as you know, Mick's like the size of my finger. But if anyone who's <laughs> ever seen a Stones contest with the prancing and the amount of energy that guy puts out, per show and think about how many shows they do. He had to be in the most amazing shape. So he was very into the idea of, you know, just playing around with Marshall. I wasn't full on James Taylor. On the other hand, I worked he and Linda out as hard as I would work out any black belt, as far as stretching and push ups and sit ups. They just, they just drew to that because it, as you can imagine, being on the road for month after month, going from city to city, it's incredibly tiring and exhausting. Right. And so the idea of actually being on the road and having someone like me and I, I you know, I became, we just became good friends. It was like, friends. you know, bodyguarding work with those sort of times. Yes, there were serious times to it, but it, you were almost like a babysitter. You know, I was just the comfort zone. They go to a party, go to a club, of course, go to the shows. You know, I was just there to make sure they were safe and okay. But I would go and eat with them everywhere and everywhere. So it was natural that I would suggest, right. hey, you know, we should we should get in the room and do some workouts. And and that's what happened. You know, I ended up going to Martha's Vineyard and training James Taylor when he was married to Carly Simon. I teach him the bow, you know, the staff and different weapons, set up a punching bag before each show that was part of the thing we would do going into another town and just just so he could release a bit of you know a, sure a stress or or whatever it else before he went on stage so it was just a really nice fit um like david bowie i ended up getting that because uh, we worked david came to australia and i worked you know as a bodyguard for david when we went to new zealand i'm not sure how it happened but i had to teach a class or a seminar he ended up coming along and watching me teach this particular class. And it was as a result of my teaching that class that he said, I, I want you to work as my full-time bodyguard. And when I say full-time, it's more when they would go on tour or to recording studio. They ended up in Canada working with David when he was there with Tina Turner doing a particular album. But 
but it was just as a result of him coming watching watching me teach a martial arts class and that was that was pretty cool he challenged me to a one-arm push-up competition the first time i met him of course i beat him but <laughs> but he was also you know really well, i can see how you bonded with him they're on the road. They're, what they're doing is they're basically taking their best friend with them who actually can also protect them if need be. But it's boring during the day. I mean, you're you're their friend and you're bonding with them. And I can say that. So, But I just want to how did you make time? Because you said you did into the 90s, but you made close to 100 films and TV episodes. How, how did you schedule? I mean, I, that didn't even make sense how you had the time to do both. Well... Because again, it was you know I I would work with them when they were in the studio doing an album or on tour. Now they weren't always out on the road and on tour. You know what I mean? So right. Right. in between all of that, I was doing movies. You know because I went over to the states predominantly as a bodyguard. I had no aspirations to get into movies. Right. It was because of training with Chuck. Chuck wanted me to work in the octagon and be his nemesis that I started the movie career. But as you know, a lot of those movies were shot in four weeks, five weeks. They're not like a Mad Max that takes seven right, months. Yeah. <clears throat> so I could fit X amount of movies and X amount of tours, you know, in the space of a year. So that's that's how that worked. And it was just a nice blend for me. Um, you know, in the bodyguarding, I got a lot of work, as I think I might have mentioned, because I never looked like a bodyguard. I'm not, like, huge and like this, I could look virtually like a member of the band. And the ones that I worked with liked that because it wasn't a heavy sort of overture around them, if that makes sense. Um, and it's, it's right. you know, getting talking about Bodyguard, there's, there's great little tidbits to all of that. Like, for instance, I remember being in, I knew exactly where I was when John Lennon was shot, you know. And how this relates is, you know, I was with James Taylor one time in New York, and I, I remember a fan saying, why does James need a bodyguard? We we love him, you know. And I remember saying to this particular person, well, that's like asking how long, how come John Lennon's dead? It wasn't about the average punter or the average person. It was that one in a million wacko that just had a, a whole different agenda. That was really what I was there for. And I remember being in Peter Ash's office in Los Angeles because I used to work Peter out as well. He was their manager. And he was on the phone and, with James Taylor and he gets off the phone and he says, wow, that was that was weird. And I said, what happened? He said, oh, I was talking to James and James said on the phone, because James was over in Central Park, Western New York, he said, wow, that sounded like gunshots. <laughs> Well, they were the actual, that was John Lennon being shot, oh, you know, shoot. and killed. Oh, and interestingly shoot. enough, the the same person that shot John Lennon had actually come up to James and got his autograph the day before. But apparently James wasn't high on the list. It's John Lennon. Who was it? Was it Chapman? Is it that was, I'm forgetting now, he who the one that was, uh, was responsible for John Lennon's death, but... He had actually gone up to James and asked for his autograph the day before. That, to me, was an example of what my job was about. It was about that one in a million person. Now, exactly. I wasn't there with John Lennon, but there were yeah. there were times I was in uh, with Stevie Nicks in some little town in USA. I remember getting out of the cars and I hear over the loudspeakers, everybody, please, you know, as all the punters are going to the auditorium, we're getting out of the limos. I, there's a loudspeaker saying, everyone, please leave your guns and knives in the car. Please don't bring them into the auditorium. And I remember thinking, <laughs> for fuck's sake, right? You know, because I'm on the side of a stage. You're looking at a whole mass of people. You have no idea, you know, because a lot of those states, wow. there's concealed carries allowed and all this sort of, of stuff. Course. And that's sort of what you're up against. And there was one letter that Stevie had received basically threatening to kill her. And we had uh, Secret Service at this concert because the same guy that had sent this, I forget whether it's the telegram or letter that to Steve in threatening the killer, had also sent a, t a telegram at that stage, you know, way back to then President uh, Ronald Reagan, basically saying this cowboy's had his day and I'm going to see to it that blah, blah, blah. 
So the same guy had said, but he'd not only sent his letter, he also sent a picture of himself and everything else. So hence cut to the concert, that guy was actually, they found him in the second row of that concert and he got yeah. taken away. But, you know, when you think about it, you're looking at all these punters, how do I, you know, this is one person has got that agenda, but that again was my job, you know, is to try and read a situation that hopefully preempt what could end up being a, a horrible situation, you know, to show. Well, let me do this, Richard. I, I have enjoyed this much as a kid in a candy store. This has been so delightful. I don't understand. Maybe you have been approached by a publisher to write a book, but you would have a bestseller just, just in all the avenues of your life. And especially the people you've worked with, you would literally have a bestseller. Um, I am going to do this. I am going to end this uh, episode because it's so good. I just want to end it here. And I just want to ask a favor, maybe in the future, we don't have to do it so quickly. I want to then bring you back for the martial arts. I'd like to get more about Bob uh, Jones, your partner, and the Machados and Gracie and all of that. But I I just want to keep this separate because this has been delightful. And thank you so much for all your time and sharing all this with us. But I, I know the viewers out there, and I have 40 uh, viewers from 45 countries around the world. They're going to love this. They're just going to love this. And, uh, and say you. hi to Judy for me and th thank her for for being so patient while you're doing this. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show again. You're welcome. And let's do it again. There's so much more we have to talk about, you know, working in Central <laughs> Park yes. and Pirates of Pens and John Belushi's funeral. I went to the John Belushi's funeral with James. It was an open coffin funeral in Martha's Vineyard. That's a fascinating story as well, you know, that whole experience. So, yeah, lots, lots of stuff we can still go through. Well. Well, the stories are what I think I love and the viewers love. So thank you so much. And listen, if you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I have, um, please like and share and, of course, subscribe. And again, thank you so much for allowing me to interview again. Until next time, ciao.